a story a while back that's kind of a, a little bit applicable. It's, it's, it's close enough. There was a, there's a guy that was um, out of work looking for a job, sees an ad in the paper, and they're hiring guys feeding the animals down at the zoo. So he figures he can, he can do that. It's not great money, but it's something. So he goes down and he's applying for the job. And then the guy doing the interview notices that he's actually a pretty, pretty big guy. So he says, uh, you know, actually, we've got another opening. It pays a little, a little better. It's a little unusual. Uh, I don't know if you'd be interested. Well, better pay? Yeah, what is it? He says, well, uh, unfortunately, a few days ago, our, our gorilla died. It was a big attraction here. And uh, we, we've got a, a gorilla outfit. I mean, if you would wear that thing and be in the cage just for a couple of days, we'll pay you double the normal money. So he says, sure, I, I can do that. So a little awkward the first day and a little hot. But uh, by the third day, he was kind of getting into it, swinging around on the bars and attracting a crowd. He got carried away and he flipped right over into the exhibit next to him where the lion was. Now the lion's checking him out. He's checking the lion out. And he's thinking, I can't exactly call out for help here. <laughs> you know, he's the gorilla. <laughs> and he's kind of, uh, <clears throat> you know, backing up and trying to figure out, can he get back up over this fence again? And the lion's getting a little closer and kind of roaring and everything. And, and finally, the lion is so close, and he's kind of got a bead on him. He says, <laughs> I'm not going to die out here in this gorilla. And he starts to scream out, help, somebody help me. And then uh, under his breath, the lion says, shut up stupid you'll get us both fired <laughs> these were two imposters in biblical language we might call them hypocrites and uh, as Jesus deals with the Pharisees once again who are really imposters in a sense but again we use that phrase hypocrite and uh, and it's just a, a transliteration right out of the right out of the Greek we just say it in the English hypocrite day so we just say hypocrite uh, but it, it means somebody that's pretending to be something they're not, but with a twist, they're pretending to be something they're not in order to be able to judge others. And that's, that's the, the religious twist here on this idea of, of a hypocrite. Uh, five things here. And uh, first we notice that Jesus is criticized by the scribes and Pharisees from Jerusalem, and that's in the verse, two verses. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. So we first notice that the Pharisees criticized the disciples for breaking, and, and again, as you have in your notes there, the oral traditions, because this was not... Uh, in, in the Word of God. It's not in the Bible. It's not a commandment. These are just oral traditions that have developed. Uh, and again, these are uh, it, what totally is implied here is this is an official delegation uh, from Jerusalem. It takes a week to get up there. They weren't just like coming by, having to come by and notice Jesus, Jesus so they'd come over and shoot the breeze. They've made a trek all the way up. Again, an official delegation from the Sanhedrin uh, at that point. And uh, he's had other encounters with them. Uh, he'll have more before it's over with. But uh, keep in mind a couple of things about the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin, again, the ruling council of uh, the Jews at that time, uh, was, was controlled by the uh, Sadducees. Sadducees were very liberal and so forth. That's why we say they are sad, you see, because they denied the, the miracles, angels, and so forth. They're the liberal side, uh, really, uh, and pretty much sold out to the Romans and so forth. In control, there were Pharisees, as we'll see later at the trials of Jesus on the Sanhedrin, there were Pharisees, not, and not all the Pharisees were hypocrites, because we're going to meet a few as we go along that we're not, that take a stand for Jesus Christ and the ones that bury him and so forth. But for the most part, they were. But the Pharisees were the back to the Bible guys. Uh, but at this point in time, they had gotten so wrapped up in the oral tradition. That oral tradition would later be written down and become the Mishnah. Later, then there would be several volumes explaining the Mishnah called the Talmud. 
But right now, it's just it's the oral tradition. They believe that it had been passed down from Moses to the elders, said from Moses to the elders. Therefore, they had to keep it and so forth, which, again, is is not true. We have no uh, information about that. But this official council comes uh, to investigate Jesus over this issue. And the criticism is over ceremonial washing your hands before uh, you eat. And, uh, and by implication also, as they, he says, why do your disciples? And part of that is, do you really deserve to have disciples? You say you're a rabbi, you're doing all these things. A lot of people say you're the Messiah at this point, but should you even have disciples? So it's kind of, a, they're really going after Jesus through, through the disciples. Uh, and, and again, when we have Passover here, uh, one of the things that we do as, as part of the, the Passover Seder is we do a ceremonial washing. So you know exactly what we're talking about. Everybody lines up, you run back, and uh, I'm there, or Kathy's there, or somebody else, and you're putting your hands out over the bowl, and we pour the water on you, and you're letting it drip off, and then drying your hands. And we're not doing that for any uh, hygiene purposes. It's part of the tradition of the Seder, uh, pair of the, so, the, uh, the ceremony and so forth. This all goes back to the idea that... Uh, uh, the priest, when they would go in, were constantly washing their hands and cleansing themselves as they would go in to, to serve the Lord. So in time, they said, uh, each, each dad, each father is the priest of his home. So because the priests are doing this here, you should be doing it in the home. Uh, there's, there's, there's some, you can understand the logic of that a little bit, but what gets transferred then is is not just because it's a nice thing to do and maybe to remember the importance of what the priests are doing daily. It becomes a point where they're criticizing now, saying that basically when, he's, when he says, why are they defiling themselves <clears throat> by not washing? They're saying, why are they in sin? Uh, and so it's, uh, it's gone to a whole other elevation. Mark's gospel gives us a little bit more information. Mark 7, 1 says, the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were, quote, unclean, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. Uh, when they had come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and, and kettles. So this is, again, what the accusation has nothing to do with the fact that they were <laughs> dirty fishermen and probably needed their hands washing. Uh, but it wasn't a hygiene issue. It was just, are they observing the issue of ceremonial cleaning of their, of their hands? And, uh, and the implication of what they're saying is that because they're not doing this, they're actually uh, in sin. So they had taken something that was uh, kind of a, an oral teaching uh, and brought it to the point where it became dogmatic. Uh, after a while then, that dogmatic statement becomes doctrine, and after a while, that doctrine became equal with Scripture, and then after a while, it actually supersedes and over Scripture. And, uh, and that's what's going on. So every time they come and accuse Jesus of breaking the law, it's not really the law, it's always their oral traditions. And... Um, and they had been doing it so long, uh, they, they forgot even why it all began. Now, this doesn't go away in the New Testament. Uh, Paul's still dealing with, it, with the church in Colossae. He says there in chapter 2, verse 8, uh, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than Christ. Uh, again, uh, the traditions that can wrap us up, even as our brother was uh, sharing earlier, so appropriate to, uh, to this text. Further on in verse 20, Paul says, Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teaching. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Paul says they're all going to pass away. They can't help us anyway. They can't restrain us in any way. In a sense, again, it's all, it's all religion and it's all for appearance. And that's why these guys are now coming and criticizing Jesus 
uh, and criticizing disciples. But uh, it leads to some some very important things that Jesus uh, then teaches uh, around this issue. So secondly, after the criticism, Jesus confronts the Pharisees for breaking the commands of God. Verses 3 to 9. Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, Whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is a gift devoted to God, he is not to honor his father with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teaching are but rules taught by men. So the criticism comes. He confronts them because they broke the command of God for the sake of their tradition. So again, in this case, and he picks just an instance, and we'll read a cross-reference to tell us that it's not just in this area. There are many other areas where they have now lifted up the oral tradition, uh, which was not a command of God, but the teaching of men, so that it superseded that which was actually the command of God. In this case, the fifth commandment, honor your father, your father and, uh, and mother. Now, <laughs> this helps us understand a little bit in Matthew 5.20, when Jesus said, <clears throat> Excuse me, for I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of God. The Pharisees, why? Because their righteousness was primarily hypocritical. It was primarily based upon the traditions of man and not the word of God. And Jesus says, your righteousness has to surpass them. Of course, that blew everybody away because, again, you have to remember that the Pharisees were really, really well looked upon. They were the religious leaders of the people. They didn't maybe think a lot of of the, the Sadducees and so forth. But if you are a religious Jew at that time, you really looked upon the Pharisees as being your spiritual leader. So how could I possibly have a righteousness that surpassed them? Well, theirs was faulty to start with. And of course, we know the only righteousness that we can have that's true righteousness is that which we have through Jesus Christ. But he says to them a very direct question. Why do you break the command of God for the sake of tradition? And again, this was the honor your father and, and mother. Now, uh, Jesus is quoting Exodus uh, 22 and Exodus 21, 17. And uh, he explains to us, certainly, if we didn't understand what it means to honor your father and mother. What does it mean to honor your father and mo mother? What is the command? It means you take care of them in their old age. That's what Jesus says right here. Why are you not giving them what they deserve? Why are you not taking care of them? Why are you not taking your finances that you're supposed to be giving to them to care for them? That's what it means. It, we always think it means saying yes, sir, and no, sir, and yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. Well, that's probably good, but, but that's not what the command is. The command is actually to care for your mother and father in their old age. So Jesus is very clear about that. But then he says, but you guys are not doing that because you're basing that on the the, the oral tradition. Again, one of the cross-references kind of uh, helps here, and it brings in a Hebrew term that uh, uh, will kind of bring a little light to the subject. Mark seven eleven, said, Jesus says, uh, But you say if a man says to a father or a mother, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is korban, that is a gift devoted to God. Then you no longer let him do anything for his father and mother, thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you handed down. And notice he says, and you do many things like that. This is just one example of what they're doing. So in other words, your, your, your father and mother might need some help. They might need some financial help. They might need help with their home. They need something that you could do for them. But you say, oh, I would love to do that, you know, but actually I've got this sum of money over here and I've actually devoted that to God and for God's service. It's Corban. I'd really like to help mom and dad, but I've given it to God. I've devoted it to God. Therefore, I really don't have to help them because I'm going to keep the oral tradition and therefore nullify what God actually told me to do. So they they'd set something up, a religious system based on their own teaching that was actually causing them to now break one of the, one of the Ten Commandments. Uh, and yet these are the guys that are coming and criticizing Jesus and his disciples because they're not doing a ceremonial washing. They criticize him. He confronts them uh, very directly. He also uh, confronts them by quoting Isaiah the prophet, calls them hypocrites, 
pretending to be something they're not, using it as an, uh, to judge others. He says, they honor God with their lips. Their hearts are far from me. They worship in vain. Their teaching are rules taught by men. There's a couple of things here that are pretty foundational to our understanding of the New Testament. Uh, one is that, he says, the problem with them, their hearts are far from me. So therefore, God cares about our hearts and not just our words or actions. God cares about our hearts. He cares about our attitudes. Uh, he really doesn't care so much about the outward things. And uh, very important, uh, Paul amplifies this in 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my bodies to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Your hearts are far from me. And as far as God's concerned, it's all about your heart. It's all about your mind. It's all about your, uh, your attitude. The second thing Jesus says in this statement is they worship me in vain. Therefore, God desires us to worship him in spirit and in truth. When we gather on Sunday morning or in your home or a Bible study during the week, we're not singing to do Christian karaoke. We're not just put the words up, sing along. I like this song. It's a good. I wish they wouldn't do that song. I like the other song. It's too loud. It's too, it's not loud. And, you know, that's not what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, again, they worship in vain and they did some pretty outrageous worship in the temple. Big band stuff, loud. You could hear it over the whole city. You think that was loud? That was nothing compared to how they would worship in Jerusalem. Uh, that's what Solomon says. You could hear the music over the entire city and they had no amplification. That's a lot of people singing at one time. That's a big band. Uh, but he says to them at this point, it's all in vain. God cares about our hearts and he cares about whether our worship is in spirit and truth. That means, is it a reality? Is it really, is it really happening? You know, we have reality shows now. So if somebody followed you around and did a reality show of your worship and your life, <laughs> would you want it to be on TV? You know, is there a reality to your, your, your relationship? Is what you're declaring as we sing really happening in your life? So Jesus makes one little statement, but it's, uh, these are huge. The third thing, he says, their teaching are but rules taught by men. Therefore, God desires us to live according to the word of God, not according to the traditions uh, of men. And again, it's interesting that uh, uh, this same error, uh, error has, uh, you know, again, crept into the, uh, the church uh, over time, where uh, at a point in time, it continues in some segments of the Christian church today, that, in fact, the teaching, the dogma of the church uh, has been elevated above Scripture itself. Now it's more important in some segments uh, of the body of Christ to, to uphold the traditions uh, rather than the teaching uh, of the Word of God uh, its, itself. <clears throat> Several years ago, I did a, a wedding here locally and, um, in a very historic church, a very beautiful church, a very traditional church, a Protestant church here in and I have to tell you that I did something totally scandalous. Uh, they probably are still talking about it in, in that church because I'm not very traditional. And, uh, and they kind of warned me about it ahead of time. But, you know, I'm just rebellious and I did it anyway. And what did I do in that wedding? I, I, I only wore my, my best Hong Kong suit that I've got and my coat and tie, but I didn't wear a black robe. And it was scandalous in that church that I would stand before that altar behind that pulpit and say anything without my black robe on. I didn't even have the heart to tell them I didn't have one. You know, but I mean, and I, I felt bad. You know, if I, if I could have found one, I would have worn it, you know, or something just to kind of calm them down a little bit. Uh, it was scandalous. So, it, you know, we can look at the Pharisees and say, well, I'm glad that's not happening anymore. Uh, it, it happens all, all the time. I remember Pastor Chuck saying he just got chewed out by a lady after service one time. She was visiting Costa Mesa, and she wanted to know why when he prayed, he didn't face the altar, because they always did in her church. She had more of a Lutheran background. Uh, but, you know, we, we get caught up in these things that are traditions of men uh, that have nothing to do with, uh, with, with Scripture. 
They change in time. When, when I was a kid, if you, uh, if you uh, mowed your lawn on, on Sunday afternoon, man, it's working on the Sabbath, man. That's scandalous. You know, he, I don't know if they'd even let you in church the, the next week. Ter- terrible thing, you know. Uh, sometimes it's cultural. You know, when our kids were growing up, we'd kind of carpool to the school they went with uh, neighbors up the street. And, um, you know, it's early morning, kind of get the kids going, get them breakfast when they're little guys and get them out the door. And I would take them sometimes and... And uh, the mom up the street would come down and pick them up, and I'd run them out to the car, you know, and sometimes just my surf shorts, you know, no, no shirt, no nothing, you know. She was a Christian lady, and was she scandalized by that? Some places they would. They would kind of freak them out, right? Some people in the main. She was Tongan. She didn't care. <laughs> she just, it's not an issue. <laughs> Never thought anything of it. But to some places, that would be, that would be horrendous. The pastor running around, no shirt, uh, just a pair of shorts on. Come on. But again, how we view, you, do you understand what I'm saying? And the, and the whole thing is we can understand and appreciate uh, different cultural things. And when I'm someplace else, if I'm in India with Gospel for Asia, I dress very nice. I have to have a dress white shirt on uh, and a pair of slacks if I'm going to stand in a pulpit because they'll think I'm some kind of heretic otherwise. And that's what I wear because I want to teach them. I want them to understand. That's fine. The trouble is when you wear that or do that or act that way and then judge other people because they don't. That's the issue uh, here. That's being hypocritical. Because we're taking things that are based on man's teaching and then superseding them uh, over Scripture itself. So important that we don't move away from the, the teaching of the Word of God. So Jesus is criticized, then He confronts them, and then He brings clarification in terms of a general principle of what makes a person unclean. Verse 10 and 11, Jesus called to the crowd and said, Listen and understand, what goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean, but what comes out of his mouth, that is what makes him unclean. So he turns to the crowd to clarify the issue uh, and, and states the, the, you know, what seems obvious to us, but it wasn't obvious to them. You know, what went in the mouth, what was kosher, what was not kosher. These were big issues uh, and so forth, still are with, uh, with many people today. But he's saying what goes in just... Uh, just passes through. It's what comes out of the mouth that makes a person unclean because it's from the heart that the mouth uh, actually speaks. Now you remember Samuel when he went to anoint to the second king of Israel, that young shepherd boy David, uh, 1 Samuel sixteen seven. The Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. One of the other sons of, uh, of, uh, that were there. The Lord does not look on the things that man looks at. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Again, so there's, there's nothing wrong with uh, observing cultural traditions and being sensitive to people and so forth. The problem is when we use those things to look down and, uh, and, and judge others. And uh, again, I, you know, I was, uh, if I would have had a little more time, I was going to show a few slides of the, uh, the baptism. One, because it was a, a great time. Two, I wanted you guys that missed it to be really envious when you saw what a great time we had and how much food we had and how good the waves were for body serving afterwards. We didn't leave till like 5 o'clock. It was really good. Uh, and then on top of that, I, for a point of illustration, uh, just, uh, you know, to, to, because actually I could show those slides and uh, without a show of hands, I could have said, how many of you were offended by that baptism? And actually, there, there would be people offended in the body of Christ because of what we did last Sunday in that baptism. Nobody had white robes on. Guys with no shirts on getting baptized, you don't get any more indecent than that at a re- religious service. Plus, we didn't even do it in the church, in a baptistry. And I'm not kidding. I mean, these are huge issues in some churches some, uh, where there is protocol. This is the way you do it. This is the way we've always done it. This is the godly way to do it. You don't do it that way. You know, the judgment against it. But uh, we need to be careful because uh, Jesus is going to kind of nail us and let us know it's uh, just it's not just certain people that have this this problem and this tendency to fall into tradition and judge others. Again, Paul in uh, in Second Corinthians uh, ten says, uh, "We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves." When they measure them by themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise, and that's the tendency. 
If you get caught up into the tradition itself and you're able to keep it, you will compare yourself with yourself or others like you. And Paul says that's not wise because the only real comparison we should have in terms of any kind of righteousness is that of Jesus Christ. And there's where we fall very short. Their problem, moving away from the word of God, adopting the traditions of men so that they can find someone else that's worse than they are and then justify and make uh, their own righteousness. Jesus is criticized, he confronts, he clarifies somewhat a general principle, and then he condemns the Pharisees using two parables, verses 12 to 14. Then the disciples came to him and asked, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? Hey, no kidding. <laughs> you just love Peter. This is just another classic line. Verse 13, he replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by their roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into a pit. So again, he's informed that uh, uh, the Pharisees may have not been real thrilled to hear that. And uh, I don't think that was big news to Jesus. And then he gives two parables. And in the first one, he condemns them to the point of their final destiny. Those guys, you're worried about those guys? You're worried about me offending them? You're worried about what they think of you? Let me tell you what's going to happen to those guys. They're like plants. And the father is not the one that planted them. And in the final end, they're going to be yanked up. Literally, he's saying, those guys are going to hell. And you're worried about what they think. Some of us are going, well, I would never do that. No, we, we get caught up in that. We care about what people who are on their way to hell care about us. We listen to their teaching through the media. We watch what they say on television. We get educated by them through the movies we watch. We learn history <laughs> on, uh, uh, from people that have a whole different perspective. Uh, we should not do that. Jesus says, leave them alone. It brings to mind Psalm 1. I mean, who are you really getting your counsel from? Jesus says, when it comes to people whose final destiny is, is hell, unfortunately, those are not the people you should be listening to. Nor should you care if you're offending them. Because in the end, you have to remember their final destiny. Now, the second parable, he says, they're like blind guides. And all those that are following them will all fall into the pit. Their final destiny is like this. What happens if you follow them? Your final destiny will be exactly the same. They're blind. They don't understand where they're going. And if you follow them and if you listen to them, that's where you will go also. So he's condemning the Pharisees, certainly. But he is certainly warning his own disciples and certainly warning us. We, we need to be very careful. He's criticized, he confronts, <clears throat> clarifies in a general sense. Uh, he condemns the Pharisees, but then he comes uh, to those last five verses and gives a very conclusive explanation <clears throat> of what it means to, for a person to be unclean. And this is really the, the heart of the whole thing here. Peter said in verse 15, explain the parable to us. Love it. Verse 16, are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and these make a man unclean. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what make a man unclean. But eating with washed hands does not make him unclean. Jesus had to be conclusive with Peter because Peter was having a hard time accepting this. Sometimes the truth is, is very difficult to accept. Uh, Peter's in his shoes and just saying, say this all again, because those are the Pharisees. Those are the guys that we look up to. Those are our religious leaders. Those are the guys from Jerusalem. I mean, we're the boys out here in the country. I'm just a fisherman. You got to say this all to me again. Uh, you know, we kind of look at Peter's statement and go, you know, this is not rocket science. But, I mean, he understands. He understands what Jesus just said. But it's like, you're going to have to say this again. Uh, and maybe in a different way. Because I'm having a hard time accepting this. This is where Peter's coming from. Explain the parable uh, to us. Now, Jesus does. Does that settle the issue with Peter? No, it doesn't at all. 
If you go on into Acts 10, even after the death and the resurrection of Jesus, even after the Holy Spirit is poured out in Acts 2, even after his Peter is preaching and 3,000 people come to faith in Christ. Even after the gospel goes to the Samaritans, how is that possible? Peter, you and John better get up there and find out what's going on because those are not Jewish people up there. In fact, we hate their guts, so go see what's going on. And they have to go up to Samaria, their first short-term mission strip. And they saw what happened. God was moving even among the Samaritans. They were blown away. If you read that text, they never shared the gospel on the way there, but they did on the way back. Their hearts were changed. And then he goes over to the, the coast, not because he's surf, but he's over on the edge of the Mediterranean there. And maybe he's learning a little bit because he stays with a guy named uh, Simon the Tanner. If you're a good kosher Jewish boy, you don't do that because they handle dead animals. And if you stay with them, you're defiled. You can't go to temple. So that was a big deal. Peter's willing to stay with this guy. Then he has a vision. Uh, and uh, of the, the, the blanket being let down from heaven, clean and unclean, representing this has nothing to do with eating kosher or not. It's Jews and Gentiles together. That's the representation. And Peter's like, no way. And he, he's got to repeat the vision three times. Why? Because he doesn't understand what Jesus says right here in, in this text. You have it all wrong in terms of what makes a person righteous versus not righteous. What condemns a person? What makes a person unclean? Is it outward things? Is it the part of the country he's from? Or whether he was grown as Jewish or Gentile? It's none of those things. It's his heart. It's what comes out of his mouth. That's the real issue. And Peter was having a hard time accepting that and would continue to have a hard time accepting that. God has to speak to him three times in that dream and direct revelation, try to help him get it. Otherwise, he would have never gone into a Gentile house and shared the gospel. Does that settle it for him? No, because later when he's up with Paul in, in Galatia, he's there eating with the Gentiles. As soon as the boys come from Jerusalem, it's like, well, sorry, I'm kosher again. And he's back over here again. I can't hang out with you guys. Uh, and Paul has to publicly rebuke him at that point. It's a tough learning curve for, for Peter. But this is the beginning of it uh, uh, right here. Secondly, Jesus had to conclusively uh, contrast the things that enter the body versus that what comes uh, out of out of the heart. It's out of the heart that the mouth speaks. If you listen to what a person says long enough, you'll get an indication of what's in their heart. Uh, if you you know hang out with them a bit, you know you can you know hi how are you you know all the the, the polite stuff and everything and never really know. But if you work all day with somebody in a workplace or you do something or uh, <laughs> if. Like I say, if you travel a bunch together, these guys are on the road together. They know each other very well. If you go on a short-term mission trip, you're with somebody, a group of people day and night for a couple of weeks, you pretty much find out what's in their heart. What they're saying is really what's, what's in, in their heart. And if there's all this stuff of the world, if there's bitterness or whatever, sooner or later in circumstances, what's in the heart will, will come out. And, uh, and that's what God is interested in. He's interested in our, our heart. And then thirdly, Jesus had to be conclusive by saying what's really in the heart of man. And I'm sure they didn't want to hear this. Many people today don't want to hear this, that it's evil thoughts, it's murder, it's adultery, it's sexual immorality, it's theft, it's false testimony, and it's slander. Jesus doesn't say that's in the heart of some people that aren't righteous like us. He says that's what's in the heart of every person. We call it original sin. We inherit it from Adam. When you sin, it shows that you're sin because you have this fallen nature with, within you. I like David Hawking's line. He says, if you knew what was in the heart of the person next to you, you'd scoot over. <laughs> of course, they would move away from you as well. And you certainly wouldn't come to hear me every week. It's in our hearts. That is the issue. That is the problem. That's why this teaching is so uh, incredibly uh, important. Uh, William Golding was a man that uh, is not a Christian, not a believer, though in his, uh, his writings and his novels, he, he uh, used Christian allegories at, at times. He was a, a self-professed uh, liberal, uh, again, because the liberal position is this. The problem is not the heart of man. The problem is, is education, economy, and, uh, and, and, and the lack of opportunities. And if you can make and give to people the right education, give them the right economic opportunities, the right handout and help up, which are 
all good things. But again, the belief is that you can do that. You can actually elevate and create, in a sense, a little utopia. That's, that's uh, liberalism. Uh, it's, in, it's political liberalism. It's also in religious liberalism of Protestants today. And uh, God bless them because of that. They do a lot of things to help people socially. But again, they deny the idea of what Jesus is teaching here, that the problem is the heart of man. They believe the problem is not the heart of man, that man is neutral. So if you can do the exterior things for him, then in fact he will elevate, take care of himself, and all will be right in, uh, in the world. That's, that's the liberal thought that is the exact opposite of what Jesus is teaching uh, here. And, uh, and William Golding said he was a self-professed liberal and totally believed uh, those, those things. He said that... Uh, uh, the, he, he writes a novel in 1953 that he said would express the defects of society and the defects of, uh, of the human nature. And the reason he does that is because uh, as part of the British Navy in World War II, he was one of those guys that drove one of those little landing crafts on D-Day. And he saw a lot that day. He was in, engaged in many other uh, major battles during World War II. And he says when he came back from that, it changed. He didn't become a Christian, but it changed how he viewed mankind and the heart of man. And so he writes a novel in 1953 uh, on, uh, on reading. It is initially uh, rejected. Somebody else reads it, publishes it in 1954. It's called... Uh, <clears throat> I almost said Lord of the Rings, but that's not it. It's Lord of the Flies. I don't know if you ever read that. I had to, It was actually required reading for me when I was in high school. If you haven't read it, Lord of the Flies is a story about a group of teenage British students who uh, are plane wrecked on a deserted island. And initially, like uh, good uh, British students, they set up a, a British type of government, make it all very orderly, how they're going to conduct themselves and get along until they're rescued and so forth. But then a group of them rebel against that and say, hey, we're out here on our own. Hey, we're teenagers. We don't need this restrictive government over us. We're going to rebel against that. We're going to form our own thing and do our own thing. And they kind of went on the, uh, the rampage. And things kind of get worse and worse until one night they actually kill one of, the, one of the other teenagers on the island. And after that, all mayhem breaks out. That, and that's what the book, Lord of the Flies, of, is about. And uh, Golding says he wrote that because he saw finally for himself what was in the heart of man. And that was in the heart of man. Leave him alone, give him the opportunity, and wickedness will prevail. And he totally flip-flopped. Again, this is not a man that's a Christian or a believer in, uh, in any sense, but he totally, uh, totally changed his, his view. I want to give you a, a couple of uh, uh, applications of this to, to maybe show it in a bigger picture and then maybe bring it back to something a little more personal in a moment. But this is why, this is why, we have such horrific uh, prison population. I don't know if you've read any statistics, but uh, our prison population in the United States is like, it's like eight times any other country you know, per capita. It's just unbelievable. And, and the, one of the reasons is because the people that run those prisons do not believe Jesus Christ. They do not believe that man's heart is wicked. They believe this thought that he can be changed somehow through programs and so forth. Now, there are guys and men like uh, Chuck Colson who developed prison ministries, uh, one program called Interchange. Uh, governor Bush, President Bush, when he was governor of Texas, uh, it said, uh, bring it into our prisons in, in Texas. Let's see how it works. It worked great. They had tremendous success. They brought guys in on a volunteer basis. Uh, they, they received Jesus Christ. They were discipled. Uh, they were taught a trade. When they went out into the, uh, and, and were released, they were put into a Christian family, into a local church. And the, the rate of them going back to prison was shrunk by like 60 or 80% compared to the national average. Tremendous success. Man, we just put that in every prison across the country because we're going to empty those prisons. And no, no, we didn't do that. I mean, Chuck Colson, that ministry has continued on, and state by state, it's like pulling teeth to get this very successful uh, ministry in these prisons because it deals with the heart of man because crime is a moral issue. It is not just an economic issue. It is a moral issue. Drug rehab. We've got dr drug rehabs all over the place, and, and we need them in a sense, but I don't know if you know, they're not very successful. They're not very successful. Most of them go back. 
because, again, they look at a drug problem uh, as a problem that is based on society. These people are actually victims. And so we need to minister to their felt needs and so forth and, and find the reason why this happened and so forth. They don't see that drugs are a moral problem. I just read a review of a book of, again, a non-Christian guy who was a researcher and he just did a whole study of people that are addicted to opiates like heroin and so forth. And, uh, and some of the fallacies uh, he found I, I thought were very interesting. One of them is in the fact that, uh, that uh, you have to really make an effort to get addicted to heroin. I, I'm sorry, I grew up in the drug culture and I was always scared to death of heroin because it was always use it once and you're addicted for life. And that's not true. Apparently, you've got to shoot up a couple times a day for at least a month to even get enough in your system to become addicted. And it's harder to get off alcohol than it is heroin. And uh, to prove his point, he mentioned uh, something that I, I was familiar with. At one point in time, Mao Zedong uh, lined up all of the heroin addicts in Beijing and basically told them, you're going to have to stop using heroin or we're going to kill you. And he'd already killed millions of his own people, so nobody was wondering if he would do it. You know what they did? They stopped using heroin. There was no drug rehab program. There was no medical help. There was no uh, methadone. There was no nothing. They just stopped. And the problem with the drug rehab that we have today is they do not see it as a moral problem. So they never deal with the heart issue because they don't believe what Jesus is saying here. It's out of the heart that these things come from. Now, you have breakthrough programs like Teen Challenge in the 60s and the 70s. They had tremendous success. Salvation Army and now newer programs like uh, Calvary's U-Turn for Christ that are having tremendous success. Why? Because it's a sin, it's a moral issue, and they deal with it, and it changes. Our whole world is really gone and slanted in our own particular culture and so forth, uh, and it's because we've moved away from this basic teaching of, we don't even want to use the word sin anymore. But Jesus is saying that's what's in the heart of every person. Now, the good news is for us individually is that it is there, but Jesus Christ died on a cross and shed his blood so that our hearts could be cleansed, so that they could be washed. Uh, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me uh, whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's where Jesus is leading to this. He's not mentioned his death on the cross yet. He's, he's, that's, they're leading to that. He's again moving away and ministering to more non-Jewish audiences, getting away from Herod. That's our context. He's about ready to go to Caesarea Philippi. We'll have the confession of Peter that he's, he's the Lord, he's the Messiah. And then he's going to announce to them that he will die on a Roman cross. That's all coming in terms of what the gospel writer Matthew is revealing to us. But if we miss this, in a sense, we miss everything else. If we don't see the issue of the heart of man, then Jesus dying on a Roman cross makes no sense to us. So it's important to understand. It's also important to understand a couple of things that, uh, that don't defile us or make us unclean. People's opinions of you don't make you unclean. Sometimes we, can, we take too much on our shoulders. What other people say, what other people think, what somebody said to me once, that doesn't defile you. Again, it's what comes out of your heart. Uh, we, we can take on ourselves a lot of condemnation that it's just, it's really from the devil and it's, it's not from God. Uh, my issue is, your issue is what's really in my own heart. And if I've come to faith in Christ and given my life to him, asked for his forgiveness, then he's cleansed my heart. I am defiled no longer. Remember what he kept saying to Peter? <laughs> Stop calling unclean what I've made clean. Uh, and certainly that's a, that's a great line for us to, to walk away with as well, to understand our fallen nature, but understand also then through Christ, I've received cleansing and a new nature so that I can be changed. That's why those guys coming out of U-turn programs are, are doing well. That's why the, the men and women coming out of those interchange programs are doing well. And that's what would change our society if, if people would understand this, because Jesus Christ is the only hope for mankind. He's the only hope for this world. And it's a message that is not getting out there or it's getting out there without the foundation of what it's all built on. Again, if we see man as basically neutral or basically good, then the cross means nothing. But if man is inherently evil in his heart and his nature and sees that and is desperate, he'll cry out to Jesus Christ and he'll forgive him of all of his sins and give him eternal life. And that's what we pray certainly for 
for each of our lives. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this very stark teaching of of Jesus here. It's easy to uh, get our eyes focused on the tradition of things and uh, and get caught up them. Lord, uh, spare us from uh, ever reaching some point because we would judge someone spiritually, religiously, because they don't look like us, dress like us, eat like us, and do the things we do or worship our way. Lord, help us to be able to uh, embrace everybody that's a brother and sister in Christ, be a, be a judge of no one in that sense. Lord, all see ourselves as sinners saved by the grace of God, and as the guys have sung this morning, all part of, of God's family. Lord, we thank you for your, your grace and mercy, and Lord, I just pray for anyone here that has never made a personal commitment to you. Maybe they've had a, a religious experience. Maybe they've grown up in a religious home. Maybe they've sought to do religious things. But Lord, each of us personally at a point in time must come to faith in you, confess our sins and ask to be forgiven. And Lord, we thank you of your words in 1 John 1, 9, that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins... You are faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and will purify us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we just pray that for each person here and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys are going to do another song. If you want prayer for any reason or if you want to, uh, again, have questions or would like uh, one of us to pray with you, I'll I'll be right up front. Be happy to pray with you uh, afterwards. And uh, again, the guys brought some CDs. Hope you'll uh, check check them out on your way out. God bless you. Wow. Man, Pastor wow, Tim. That's like getting a, a vitamin right in the arm like this. Amen? As yeah. he was uh, winding up his message there, finishing it up rather, I just, I, I just kept thinking of as far as the east is from the west, so has God removed my transgression from me. And my, my sin, my past, the thing that haunts me, um, it is uh, amazing to me that God would say it is the east as far as from the west, not the north from the south because you go north you eventually hit south again and you start treading back down that 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 path but you go east you're always removed from the west and that's where my sin is at that's where my junk is at all the stuff that was weighing me down and so take take that and know that when god has forgiven you he has forgiven you not just that but he's also forgotten it just rely on that mercy that's what this song is about we're going to close with that we weren't planning on doing that but that's what the Lord is doing with that message from me in my heart. So, uh, is it up there? Did we get the lyrics up? Hey, there we go. All right. Sorry, it's like a really cheap font. I have a bad computer. I just. <laughs> Let's all stand up, family.
Yes, I will. 